Okay, so um, I'll uh, start the webinar now. So welcome to the webinar of today. So it's uh, the second webinar of, of the series and the topic is applications of piezoelectric materials and I'll be giving the talk. And um, you can see the, the rest of the webinars here. So if you see some interesting topics, uh, please don't hesitate to, to register for, for the upcoming webinars. So I'll change to the to the presentation now. If you hang on for a moment. So, as I said before, um, there's been some uh, indications of of sound problems. So please. If you cannot hear what I'm saying, uh, please uh, just uh, send a, a chat message. So um, I'll also put it on, on a chat, just a minute. Okay, so um, I will uh, start now, assuming that uh, everybody can hear the sound. So the topic of today is applications of piezoelectric ceramics. Yeah. Yes, so um, I'm just checking with my colleague if uh, the sound is going through. So uh, the, um, the topic of today is applications of piezoelectric ceramics and uh, I will uh, just get a laser pointer. So here you have an overview of the um, of the topics of today. So uh, after the introduction, I will uh, uh, go on with a, a lot of different uh, applications. I can tell you that uh, all in all, we have more than twenty applications that I would like to show you today. But uh, it will be a, a very short overview. It's just really to give every, everybody a sense of uh, what can be done with the uh, piezoelectric materials. So uh, it's not even an exhaustive overview. Uh, it's just uh, 20 applications that are giving good examples of, uh, of the uh, possibilities of, of using the, uh, the piezoelectric materials. Okay, so um, I have confirmation now from, uh, from certain um, participants that you can hear me, so I'll just go on. Okay, so um, first uh, I'll give an overview based on the uh, type of effect. Uh, those of you who attended the first webinar will know about the direct piezoelectric effect and the converse. So first uh, the direct effect where we convert mechanical energy into electrical energy. So we uh, one simple example is the ignition unit where you ignite, uh, for example, a flow of gas uh, with, a, with a spark, uh, which the spark being generated by, by the stress converted into an electric uh, spark. Uh, another similar application uh, with the, the direct effect is uh, uh, pressure sensors where you have a pressure and you convert that to an electrical signal. And uh, I'll also show uh, an example of, of a hydrophone, which is basically an underwater microphone. So moving now to the converse effect. Uh, one example uh, that I showed last time was uh, the buzzer. So a kind of loudspeaker where you convert the electrical signal into some vibration. I can also mention uh, ultrasonic cleaning and, uh, and other um, examples here on the list. You will see some examples uh, in a moment. And uh, finally, yeah, on this slide, I'll show you that uh, quite a few uh, applications use both effects. So uh, here, uh, for example, the medical imaging, you uh, use both the converse effect to generate a sound signal, and then you use the direct effect to convert the sound signal into 
a, a, an electrical signal. And uh, basically the similar principle is used for underwater acoustics or non-destructive testing, as you'll see a little later. Okay, let me move on. Uh, just by saying that um, you see that the piezoelectric effect can be a link between the electrical and the mechanical world. So uh, another overview uh, is uh, this one. It's um, a little less colorful, but it's um, giving one extra detail that uh, some applications are resonant applications and some are non-resonant. So uh, looking here, you can see that um, in the resonant applications, uh, you uh, you have, for example, the uh, bulk acoustic waves and the surface acoustic waves, and also uh, a lot of uh, ultrasonic applications uh, use uh, the, the high conversion efficiency uh, obtained at resonance. And there are also some resonance sensors um, where you actually measure the shift of resonance frequency. And uh, among the non-resonant applications uh, are the actuators, for example, and uh, uh, some of the piezoelectric motors and, and also the, especially the positioning devices. <clears throat> um, yes, and, and um, in the uh, other end, with using the direct effect, you have a lot of sensors uh, that are non-resonant, like uh, force and torque and acceleration sensors. So to begin with, uh, you have the, the simple application that I mentioned before, uh, the uh, the piezo lighter, where you generate a spark to, to ignite the gas. Uh, this is at a rather low frequency. And um, uh, I, whenever relevant, I put uh, the, the operating frequency uh, in the top of the uh, screen. And uh, you can see here another example uh, is the hydrophones. Uh, and uh, these hydrophones are omnidirectional uh, and therefore the, uh, the spherical shape. Uh, also in, in the sort of uh, low frequency uh, uh, range, uh, you can see the, some examples here of uh, ultrasonic motors, uh, like these uh, uh, small uh, motors in, inside a camera lens. So uh, next uh, example I'll give is, uh, is uh, the application of uh, vibration sensors. Uh, you see here and accelerometer, uh, basically a, a rather simple design where you see um, the piezoelectric uh, uh, ceramics uh, shown here as uh, three uh, red discs and they are just uh, stacked on top of each other. And uh, on, uh, on top of those uh, you have a, a seismic mass, uh, which is uh, just some, some weight that will give a, a higher output because of the uh, higher stress value when you when you uh, expose it to some vibration. So um, the, the seismic mass is kept in place by this uh, pre-stress rod. And um, you can use this with uh, only one ring or with uh, several rings and uh, generally it depends on how sensitive the material is for a material with low sensitivity, for example, at high temperature, you would uh, use uh, several rings uh, rather than just one. And uh, such a sensor may, may look like this uh, with, with some uh, tight housing uh, around it. It's uh, interesting to, to think about the, the frequency also for, for the accelerometer application. You uh, generally use them in the linear range. So uh, you really want a, a flat response uh, uh, depending on the frequency so that you uh, you can be sure that uh, that in the uh, designated frequency range you you get a, a, a quite a linear uh, behavior and then when you approach the resonance frequency you are basically outside the the usable frequency range of the accelerometer another uh, plot is, is shown here where, where you see uh, that the uh, Typically, uh, the frequency range that you can use is uh, maybe up to 30% of the uh, resonance frequency. In cases where, where there is a, a high transverse sensitivity, you actually should be careful that, that even the transverse resonance frequency may 
may actually limit your uh, usable frequency range. Uh, I have some examples here of, um, of accelerometers. So uh, these are designed by the, the company Bruyl and Care. Uh, and in this case, it's not pure compression. We use the shear mode. So uh, a famous design of, of these uh, shear mode accelerometers is the so-called delta shear, where you have uh, one, two, three uh, plates, shear plates, uh, which are here marked in red. And they are attached to a center rod, which is triangular. And um, outside these uh, three um, shear plates, uh, we have uh, the, 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 the uh, manufacturer has, uh, has attached some uh, some uh, heavy uh, plates of of metal. So it's actually a seismic masses, uh, one for each of these plates, meaning that uh, when the when the uh, accelerometers are uh, shaken up and down, you actually get uh, an electrical signal, uh, and uh, depending on the direction of the vibration or acceleration, you you get different signals from these three plates, meaning that you have a, a, a true triaxial measurement. Uh, here you see some uh, some other examples uh, using the uh, the shear mode. Uh, also here you have uh, two shear plates and in this case it's a uh, one shear tube with the the seismic mass uh, also being tubular and, and uh, fitted around it so uh, let's just see um now i uh, move to the uh, to the next application so let me just see here. okay so um and now uh, moving up in frequency we uh, come to uh, the example of uh, ultrasonic cleaning and machining so uh, generally the the frequency is uh, rather a bit higher here. Uh, it's a few kilohertz up to even 500 kilohertz. So uh, in this case, um, there is an ultrasonic bath and uh, you have some uh, some um, disks of a piezo ceramic material attached to the outside of this uh, steel tank. And uh, using ultrasound, you can actually generate a, a high amplitude uh, ultrasonic waves in the, uh, in the liquid inside the uh, the, the tank. So this is very efficient for ultrasonic cleaning, which is uh, well known in in, in uh, the laboratories and even for, for cleaning uh, uh, glassware or for cleaning glasses uh, at the uh, in the optic uh, shop. Okay, so um, another example here, uh, sort of in the same corner is uh, the ultrasonic machining where you can use uh, uh, ultrasonic welding if you want to join uh, two pieces of plastic or two pieces of metal, it's a very efficient way of, of getting a, a very quick joining uh, just by, by rubbing two pieces of material together. And then you'll get a, a softening or even local melting just in the friction zone. Uh, so uh, an example where this is used is for, for the attachment of, uh, of these plastic uh, mounting devices uh, to uh, the bumper of a car. So the, the, these uh, inserts are actually for holding uh, distance sensors, uh, uh, you know, acoustic distance sensors for, for controlling uh, whether you, uh, you hit something with the car. And uh, these um, fixtures are actually attached to the bumper just using uh, uh, this ultrasonic welding for, for a very short time, just uh, less than a second. I have a, a third example uh, in, on this slide, and this is uh, for ultrasonic cutting and grinding. So, uh, the, the point is for very hard materials, uh, you can actually, instead of using just a, a hard metal for, for cutting or, or drilling, you can actually use an abrasive slurry, meaning a suspension of uh, hard abrasive particles. And then the, the movement is coming from a transducer working, for example, at 20 kilohertz, and when this uh, tool is vibrating up and down, you will um, actually uh, machine uh, material off the uh, workpiece. So a very efficient way for, 
of the hard materials. The next example uh, I've chosen is uh, sonar chemistry and uh, chemical uh, extraction and uh, other industrial processing. So uh, beginning with the uh, chemical reactions, uh, these are five examples of, uh, of chemical reactions that can be performed basically uh, without any ultrasound. But the point is that if you use ultrasound in a smart way, you can really make them much more efficient. So uh, if you're a chemist, maybe you'll uh, recognize some of these uh, reactions, but this is not that important. Uh, just look at some examples. Uh, with uh, 18 hours of reaction time, you may get 88% uh, without any ultrasound, but, but then when you apply ultrasound at the right conditions, just in the 1.5 hours, you can get a, a higher reaction uh, completion, so you can get a 95% reaction. Um, just uh, in, uh, in a fraction of the time. And uh, you see some other convincing uh, cases here. Uh, for example, for oxidation here, maybe you get almost the same conversion efficiency, but uh, in uh, one quarter of the time. And uh, this is how it may look. Uh, in practice, you, uh, you have a reaction uh, mixture down here, then you attach the ultrasonic uh, horn uh, and uh, you see that the transducer is up here and uh, the uh, vibration is, is transferred uh, with this uh, mechanical arrangement and then uh, the, uh, the sound energy is, is really transmitted into the uh, reaction um, container here. And uh, of course it's, uh, it's important that the, uh, that the um, whole apparatus is, uh, is uh, uh, fixed at a at a node point, meaning a, a point where, where there's a zero displacement. Otherwise, it'll be very difficult to to hold the, the whole transducer assembly. Um, I have a, a further um, figure here uh, showing one example where where you see again the the ultrasonic energy transmitted down here, and inside uh, the bubble. You can actually have some uh, some reactions going on, like in this case, it's the dissociation of uh, water molecules, so that uh, you actually get a, a free proton here, which is uh, ready to react with the copper. So uh, you uh, transfer a lot of acoustic energy, which will uh, really uh, enhance the the operation. Okay, moving on, there are some other examples of of uh, using ultrasonic uh, energy to enhance uh, certain processes. So for example, if you want to, to dry or dehydrate the material, you can combine uh, conventional heating with uh, ultrasound or other types of uh, heating like microwave heating and even uh, vacuum drying. Uh, the, the point is that if you combine those with ultrasound, you will have a much more efficient uh, drying or dehydration. The, uh, the next example is for extraction. From, from various uh, uh, materials, for, for example, here from, from some organic materials like uh, palm granate or, or mango peels, uh, olive leaves or, or peanut seeds, you can uh, extract certain, uh, certain uh, substances uh, from those uh, with the help of ultrasonic energy. And uh, yet another example uh, I have here is uh, extraction of uh, mineral, minerals. So uh, this case is actually some intermetallic compound of uh, aluminum and uh, zirconium, where you have a, a much better extraction uh, uh, using the, uh, the effect of ultrasound, where you can, for example, break uh, large agglomerates into small agglomerates and, and get a, a higher active surface. Uh, these are just some, some um, figures from the paper showing uh, some, some study of, of how the, the, the the mechanism of, of extraction can be optimized. Uh, the final examples are for uh, heat transfer enhancement in, in liquids and, uh, and for the recovery of oil. Now uh, moving to something very different. Uh, it's uh, the underwater acoustics. Uh, and uh, in the first uh, example, uh, I show how it can be used for fish finding. So. Uh, here you see uh, a fishing vessel and uh, on the bridge, uh, it may look like this with a, a lot of uh, 
of computer screens and on uh, on some of the screens you can actually see uh, what what is uh, uh, you know the the image generated by by the um, by the fish finder by the acoustic fish finder so you can actually see uh, basically the the density of, of a school of fish and, and um, also get a size distribution of of the the fish down there uh, and uh, looking at uh, at uh, the uh, another screen, uh, you can really see how how large the the school of fish is, and and also in in which direction it is uh, located and uh, and uh, moving, so that you can quickly uh, move in on it and uh, and start uh, catching the fish by throwing out the net. Um, a transducer for for this may look like this, so it's completely uh, encapsulated and and can be mounted on the on the hull. Of the ship. Next example of underwater acoustics is for for mapping and searching. So first, uh, a case where where the objective is to to map a, a canal uh, with a you know a, a rather a simple um, cross section, but you actually want to to map out the um, the depth and make sure that there are no objects in the way. So here you, you see a number of transducers that are mounted on a, on a boom like this. And uh, with such a, a measurement, you can actually uh, have a, quite a, a detailed uh, uh, mapping of what is down there. You see uh, in this case, it's down to, to six meter. And um, this example is actually from, from Venice, where you can even uh, see some, uh, some small uh, boat or, or barge uh, down uh, at the bottom uh, at around uh, six meters of depth. Another example is uh, at a higher depth where you actually see uh, a shipwreck on the bottom of the sea. And finally, uh, this is uh, used a lot for so-called bathymetry. Uh, this is uh, the uh, the mapping of, uh, of uh, the uh, bottom of the sea, basically. And uh, we can go down to, to quite a, a high uh, depth uh, using uh, ultrasound. So I have uh, one example here of, uh, of a very large uh, transducer array. You see there are three persons uh, working on, on mounting this uh, at the bottom of, of, the, of the ship uh, hull. And uh, this is actually quite large elements. And, uh, the ref resonance frequency may be as low as 12 kilohertz. And with uh, such a low frequency, you can actually have a, a very large uh, distance uh, where, where you can uh, map the, the, um, the water, uh, the, the bottom of the sea. So it could be like in the, in the case of, uh, of the um, Tonga Trench or, or, or the Philippine Trench, uh, where it's down to 11 kilometers of, of depth. Uh, this can actually be be mapped with, um, with this kind of transducer. Uh, final uh, example of underwater acoustics is actually for positioning. So uh, you can think of, of something uh, similar to, to a, a GPS, but uh, something which is working uh, underwater. So uh, here uh, you have a transponder uh, at the bottom of the sea. Uh, so basically something uh, receiving a, a, an ultrasonic signal and uh, sending it uh, back. And um, then if you are in a ship with, a, with the right type of transducer, you can actually send signals down to, to this um, transponder and uh, get a, uh, an idea of uh, where you are in comparison uh, or relative to the transponder. So um, you can see some, some different uh, designs of, of, of the uh, active device, so this is uh, almost uh, spherical and, and gives a, a very high uh, angle of, uh, of acoustic signal. And it could also be a, a more narrow angle, like in this case. Um, and uh, this is what is really mounted uh, on the hull of the ship. So uh, it should be mounted like this with, with the screws. And then uh, when it's active, you can actually uh, lower it down into the water to, to get a uh, to actually to to move free of the of the ship uh, to get a good uh, signal, 
Another case uh, of application is for an oil rig like this, uh, where you may need a very high precision. So here you have four transponders and uh, you can actually get the, uh, the distance and, and the bearing uh, relative to all four transponder, transponders as once. Well. And you, you'll get some kind of, uh, of a screen uh, view like this, where you can see the, the direction and, and the distance to, to all the transponders that are, that are within the uh, range. New application uh, flow meters. So uh, first I'll show uh, the, the most common one, which is the time of flight flow meter. Here, a uh, sound signal is, uh, is uh, transmitted from, from transducer A to transducer B, and uh, also a signal sent from uh, transducer B to A. So uh, if um, the uh, time of flight from A to B is the same as from uh, B to A, it means that uh, the, the liquid in the uh, pipe here is actually not moving. But uh, once uh, you can detect a difference in uh, transmission time, you know that uh, the liquid is moving. And uh, from, from the difference in, in, uh, between uh, the two time values, you can actually deduct the, um, the uh, velocity of flow. So, so you really get a, a flow measurement uh, with this uh, relatively simple uh, measurement. Of course, you, you need to take into account also the, the angle uh, of uh, transmission relative to the direction of flow. Another principle is shown over here. This is uh, the Doppler flow meter, where you actually have a transducer, uh, just uh, one transducer, and then you are uh, transmitting a wave and uh, you are listening for, for the uh, a received signal. And uh, if there is a frequency shift between uh, the uh, transmitted and the received wave, uh, this is uh, actually a Doppler shift. So that, that will actually give you a, a measure of, of the uh, velocity of the flow. But for this, you, you need some kind of uh, reflectors inside the, uh, the liquid. So uh, it could be bottle, bubbles. It could also be some particles like uh, uh, sand particles in a river or something. A uh, third uh, type of, uh, of flow meter that I'll show is, is uh, the vortex flow meter, uh, which is uh, mainly used for, for gases. And here you actually generate some, uh, some vortex uh, in, the, in the flow. And uh, depending on, on, the, uh, on the sound generated by, by this uh, turbulence, uh, you can actually also calculate the, um, the flow uh, velocity. Yeah, and uh, as you see in, in the comment, uh, it may be uh, very important to to have a, a very precise measurement of the flow because uh, sometimes it's uh, it's very uh, very valuable uh, liquids that are being uh, pumped or sent through the pipes. Um, next uh, application I'll show is uh, ultrasonic Doppler devices uh, for the for the medical field. So uh, one example is for measuring the heart rate. Uh, this is a uh, one case of a, of a Doppler uh, measurement device for, for, for fetal monitoring. So you can actually detect the, the heartbeat of, uh, of the fetus of a pregnant woman. And then um, there are other cases of, um, of uh, yes, yeah, other probes. Again, you see, you can actually get a, a the, the pulse uh, rate here, so uh, uh, let's say the, the heart rate of uh, 150, so probably a, a fetus. And uh, uh, other designs here where, where you uh, have a, a different design and you, you may do a lot of statistics and, and uh, this is very good for also for monitoring of, of patients. Uh, these are some examples of uh, vascular probes probes that can be inserted into, a, for example, a blood vein and do measurements inside the veins. And here you see also a case of, of flow measurement, possibly for, for patients where, where there's a, a less, a, let's say, a circulation of the blood for some reason. 
these are examples of uh, transcranial probes where you can actually measure through the through the skull and um, invasive probes uh, that can also be inserted uh, inside the body uh, possibly uh, during operations um, a further case of, uh, of blood flow monitoring is um, uh, an advanced one, uh, the vector flow imaging, typically operating uh, between two and five megahertz. So uh, in this case, uh, a multi-element array transducer is, uh, is used. Uh, and uh, here the example is with 192 elements uh, working at 4.1 megahertz. And uh, here we are looking at uh, at an artery uh, close to the heart, uh, a carotid artery. And uh, exactly, uh, we are looking at a bifurcation where the blood flow is, is actually disturbed for some reason. So uh, here you see the, uh, the image is generated. So the bifurcation is, is here. And you actually see a, a very nice uh, flow profile showing the, uh, the velocity as a color code. And you also see the directions. And uh, what you should notice here is that uh, uh, up here you actually have some uh, some turbulence. You can see some of the arrows going in the other direction. So uh, this is what we would call a less optimal uh, flow, of course. And uh, um, this is actually, um, in this case, it's a, um, a simulation. And uh, over here, it's a, it's a measurement of, of the real case uh, where you actually see in the uh, in the MR scanner, uh, you know, a, a section of, of the of the artery, and again, you you see the uh, the real measurement of the blood flow. Uh, this is uh, the uh, the reference for for this study. Yeah, and uh, further further case of the of the measurement uh, which is done in vivo. So the, the next example I'll show is uh, for for the ultrasonic imaging. I I mentioned this uh, example in the uh, in the lecture, the uh, you know uh, in the in the first webinar. So um, this is a standard uh, baby scanning or ultrasonic Im imaging of a of a fetus, where the the frequency may be typically a couple of uh, of megahertz, but uh, Ultrasonic imaging can can be uh, used uh, even down to a few hundreds of, of kilohertz or maybe 100 kilohertz, uh, depending on how uh, how deep you need to to go in the body and uh, how high resolution you need. So for very high resolution, uh, if you need to distinguish small details, you actually need to go to a, a very high frequency. Another example is, is here, and this is uh, using a very advanced setup where it's a, a 3D measurement, uh, which is performed by a, by a large uh, two-dimensional array. And uh, actually, you can basically get a, a, a movie uh, with a, you know, uh, showing the, the, the movement uh, in real time of, of the uh, fetus. Uh, now I, I come to uh, the other important part of a medical ultrasound, which is a therapeutic ultrasound. So, so not uh, just for for seeing things or, and for diagnosing, but uh, but for uh, actually uh, treatment of different uh, diseases or conditions. So generally, uh, the intensity is much higher than for a diagnostic ultrasound. It may be ten thousand times as high as uh, for diagnosis. And uh, an important uh, uh, case here is when you use a uh, focused ultrasound for, for treating some medical conditions. I have more details on that on the next slide, but it could be for destruction of tissue or for uh, neurological stimulation. Um, other biomedical applications uh, are listed here. It could be for drug delivery. For example, if you want to administer some, some uh, drugs directly to the brain. Normally you'd have the, the problem with the, the blood brain barrier, but you can, with ultrasound, you can actually uh, open the, the blood brain, brain barrier if you do it in uh, the right kind of stimulation. There's also the, the treatment of uh, vascular occlusions. 
and uh, you can also use it for uh, wound healing in some cases and also for cosmetic treatment. So this is a, a, a case of the well-known example of the lithotripta where you are blasting kidney stones. This has been known for, for many years. And this is a, an example of, uh, of a treatment of a vascular occlusion where you can actually transmit the, the sound, uh, the, the acoustic energy through this uh, very thin uh, uh, tube here. Okay, so going more into details so with the focused therapeutic ultrasound, uh, I have uh, uh, looked up in, in the um, Focused Ultrasound Foundation, the FUSF. Uh, they have uh, listed uh, rather recently no less than 152 different uh, clinical indications uh, that have been looked into uh, using uh, uh, the treatment uh, of, of with ultrasound. So uh, this is a very quickly expanding field. Uh, in 2018, it was only 53. So um, already now, uh, 34 of, of these um, uh, treatments of some clinical conditions have uh, approval in one or more countries. So uh, uh, I mentioned the lithotripta already, but uh, a very interesting field is uh, the destruction of tissue. This can be by uh, thermal ablation, or it could also be by a histotripsy or microvascular disruption. Uh, so for example, uh, cancer therapy, where you want to kill cancer cells, basically. Uh, this had been used already for the treatment of uh, prostate cancer, bone cancer, and so on, as you see here. It, uh, ultrasound can also be used to treat uh, uterine fibroids and also uh, breast uh, fibroadenoma. So, uh, um, so some conditions that, that, that may be, uh, you know, treated possibly by, by surgery, but uh, could be uh, treated much uh, in a much uh, less invasive way by uh, focused ultrasound. Uh, we also have examples of uh, thyroid, thyroid nodules or glaucoma in the eye. Uh, among the neurological diseases that have been looked into is uh, essential tremor, where the patient uh, is, um, is uh, shaking, for example, uh, shaking of, of hands. Uh, this uh, some uh, tremor is also seen in uh, some cases of Parkinson's disease, and uh, both have been treated uh, quite successfully with a. Uh, focused ultrasound. Another example is a uh, neuropathic pain, uh, where you have uh, pain related actually to, to, to some, some limbs uh, that, that have uh, uh, undergone uh, surgery. So uh, even uh, pain related to uh, amputated uh, 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 leg or, or arm. It has also been used to, to treat uh, obsessive com compulsive disorder and uh, depression. So I'll give some uh, some examples uh, in, in the next. Uh, I'll just point out that uh, you may have heard the, the term uh, HIFU, high intensity focused ultrasound, which is uh, quite popular in this field. So uh, I look a little more into the, the case of uh, prostate cancer. So uh, according to, to one of the, uh, of the companies uh, making equipment for, for this, uh, the, at some point there were 39 million patients uh, just in the industrialized countries. I think that the number is higher now. They can in principle be treated with a, a less than three hours session and with a very high success rate and without being hospitalized. So this is uh, how it may look. Uh, you have a, a focused uh, ultrasonic uh, transducer here. So, so it's, it's really shaped as a lens so that you can focus the energy in the in a certain area of the prostate gland where you want to uh, ablate uh, the, uh, the tissue. So in this case, it's focused uh, uh, ultrasound from, from the outside. There's another design here from another company where it's uh, uh, actually a, a linear array of, of transducers that are, that are transmitting uh, ultrasonic energy into the prostate gland like this. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, you know the um, the ultrasonic energy is uh, is uh, 
also supplemented by by cooling because uh, you actually need to protect the the tissue around so, so it's actually water cooling here performed uh, through the anus uh, in order to prevent the 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 same tissue uh, yet another example of focused ultrasound uh, therapeutic ultrasound is uh, the movement of kidney stones I'll, I'll not go too much into details but you see uh, different sizes of uh, kidney stones that have been uh, actually moved around uh, just using ultrasound focused ultrasound and uh, uh, yeah some uh, results for, from this study where it was um, shown that it was easier to, to move smaller than larger stones, but even uh, kidney stones up to even 10 millimeters of size could be moved uh, several millimeter. And the point uh, or the, the objective was to, to move them uh, close to the, to, um, to the um, uh, urine um, uh, canal so that you could actually uh, get, them, uh, get them out uh, without uh, surgery. Uh, these are some uh, some uh, images showing a, a real uh, study on, on a in vivo uh, on a patient. So uh, now moving to a very different uh, case, uh, acoustic wave filters, and uh, this is uh, the application that I know of uh, using the the highest frequencies. So. Uh, the highest frequencies I, I've heard of is uh, 16 gigahertz, uh, showing that, that the piezoelectric effect is, is actually uh, uh, an effect which is uh, extremely uh, useful for, for high frequencies. Uh, in, this, in these cases, uh, the, the um, manufacturers tend to use uh, uh, single crystals. So uh, more traditionally, it's it been... Uh, uh, made of quartz in, uh, in special uh, cuts, uh, meaning uh, special directions compared to the crystallographic axis. And the frequencies may be even down to one kilohertz and as high as uh, 300 megahertz. More recently, uh, in, in the last couple of uh, decades, uh, surface acoustic waves uh, filters have been uh, developed and uh, these may be up to, for example, three gigahertz using materials such as uh, lithium niobate or lithium tantalate. And generally, uh, uh, this will use uh, an interdigital transducer with, um, with an electrode pattern with, uh, with the single lines uh, being uh, in this uh, interdigital uh, pattern. Um, even more recently, uh, bulk acoustic wave filters have been uh, generated. And uh, this may be up to uh, 16 gigahertz, as I mentioned before, and uh, um, different designs include uh, the film bulk acoustic resonator and the air gap resonator and uh, the solid mounted resonator. So uh, uh, a device may uh, may look like this, so it can just be mounted on a on a PCB, and uh, this is uh, an example of of how the uh, these interdigital electrodes uh, may look. So you have a uh, to uh, to reference uh, signals here, and then you you have the the signals uh, the, the the real uh, signal uh, paths are shown here. So the idea is that uh, that if if this is uh, really optimized for a specific uh, frequency, you can uh, filter out undesired frequencies uh, because they will not be transmitted effectively uh, uh, through this filter. Uh, this is uh, one example of, of how this uh, bulk acoustic wave filter may look in the case of this uh, solid mounted re resonator. So uh, you see that there are three layers here with uh, different acoustic impedances. And then the, uh, the objective here is to, to really uh, uh, get the right thicknesses uh, so that you can uh, have a good transmission at very specific frequencies and uh, filtering out the undesired frequencies. Uh, here you see uh, some, some plot of, of performance uh, versus uh, frequency. So when you go up to very high frequencies, uh, you generally need to move away from, from the saw devices and up, into the, uh, up to the bulk acoustic wave filters. You see one example here is uh, 
local area networks like this uh, uh, working at 5.5 gigahertz. So uh, the final application I'll, I'll touch upon is uh, energy harvesting. Uh, I, I've noted that it's popular. It's received a lot of interest. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe uh, I would say that uh, commercially it will not be as uh, as important as uh, many of the applications I've shown so far. But but it's actually still a very interesting application for for development and for some future applications. So you see some uh, some reasons for developing uh, energy housing here. You can actually replace batteries or power cables, which will give you a lot of freedom and uh, maybe uh, make you able to to uh, apply a, a lot more sensors than you would be able to in the case where it was uh, um, necessary to either change batteries or to to make wiring uh, to a large number of sensors, which would not be feasible. So uh, some examples that, that are actually in use are smart metering uh, for energy and uh, tire pressure monitoring. So this is a, like a, a case where where energy housing is used for, for these energy meters, and um, this is a case of uh, of the tire pressure monitoring. So um, just uh, uh, to give an overview, uh, such energy houses could work in uh, compression or flexion. And they can uh, work at different frequencies, so uh, either below resonance uh, in the quasi-static case, or even dynamic below resonance. Or uh, for the for the highest efficiency, you could actually hit a, a resonance where you can get a, a higher uh, energy conversion. So uh, I have some examples uh, showing the um, uh, some energy harvesters we have we have worked on, which are working in inflection at low stress. So uh, some general considerations uh, of of this uh, case where it's basically a, a vibration sensor where you want to have as high an output signal as possible, and uh, then you can compare the outside resonance and the resonance case where at resonance you actually get a, a much higher displacement uh, due to the uh, quality factor of the uh, of the resonator of the oscillator. Um, I'd like to just mention that the uh, there are different figures of, of merit and uh, it's well known in the field that, that, uh, that the figure of merit for energy housing is uh, the D coefficient times the G coefficient but Sometimes this is used uh, in in, a, in an incorrect way uh, because uh, uh, what people generally um, find in 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 the, in the in tables of of material properties is uh, sometimes uh, the D three three and the G three three, but it's uh, very important to to notice that this is valid uh, in the case of of pure compression. So if it's a, a bender uh, like I showed before, uh, you know, a bimorph or a, a flexion energy harvesting uh, device, you should actually use uh, D31 and G31. Uh, and uh, uh, you may not uh, actually see an optimum for for these uh, two parameters uh, for the same materials as uh, when you look at the D33 and the G33. So uh, just to show some examples of some uh, of our materials and uh, Especially if you want to optimize this D33 times G33, you should actually go for a, a porous um, piece of T material where you get a, a very high figure of merit. But uh, if you uh, think that this would be useful for, for flexion, you can actually compare the numbers and see that uh, uh, here you actually have a much lower figure of merit in the case of the, of the flexion uh, figure of merit. Okay. So um, as I mentioned, uh, it looks a little different when you are in at resonance. Then, uh, uh, as long as as you can get a fairly high Q and a fairly high coupling coefficient, uh, the figure of merit is can actually be reduced to just the the quality factor of the resonator. Okay, I have now reached uh, the the conclusion. So. Um, as you've seen, uh, piece electricity can be used for a 
very large uh, number of applications. We've seen some 20 applications here, but uh, there are more than that even. When you want to have a link between uh, mechanical and electrical energy. Uh, we've seen examples of the direct effect and also uh, of the converse effect. And uh, of course, uh, even uh, cases where you use uh, the two in combination. So uh, you need to choose uh, the, the best material for a given application. And uh, that really depends on the operating conditions. And uh, I haven't uh, given a lot of, of uh, cases of, uh, of, for example, high temperature applications, but this could be for for accel accelerometers where you may need to operate at uh, above 500 degrees, and then you need to, to find a material that will uh, withstand such high temperatures. Um, so generally you need to find the right trade-off between different properties. Uh, in the end here, I showed uh, examples of the concept of a figure of merit that may help you, help you to, to choose uh, the best material uh, if you know that for, for a specific application. Okay, uh, this is uh, uh, the end of the talk. So uh, now if there are any uh, questions, you, you may uh, put them on the, uh, the Q&A or either this or on the chat, uh, it's up to you. So I'll just uh, wait if, if there are any, any questions uh, to these. Um, very different applications. I hope you've you've uh, had some uh, some impression of uh, some of the uh, very different uh, uses of of the materials. I'll just uh, wait a little. So, let me just see. I think um, as far I can see, as I can see, there are no. No questions for this, so uh, I think we can uh, we can end the session, and uh, I will uh, before ending. I will just um, stop sharing here, and uh, maybe go back to the overview of the um, of the webinars that you see now. So. Um, Please uh, think of, uh, of uh, the upcoming uh, four webinars. I can uh, recommend uh, all of them. And the, the next one is uh, done by Thomas Kelly from Precision Acoustics. And uh, here you'll, you'll get a very uh, good insight into the uh, fundamentals of uh, how to design uh, ultrasonic transducers. So we're hoping to see some of you on the next webinar, which is on the 9th of November. Okay, thank you uh, to all of you for attending. Bye.